We are going to continue um, in our series that we started last week uh, called uh, Giving Back to God. Did you know, I want to ask you this question, did you know that a sense that we will live forever somewhere has shaped just about every civilization in human history? This idea of there being another life. Australian Aborigines. They pictured heaven as a distant in island beyond the western horizon. The early Finns thought it was a, a, a distant island far away in the east. Mexicans, Peruvians, Polynesians believed that they went to the sun or to the moon after death. Native Americans believed that in the afterlife their spirits would hunt the spirits of buffalo. You may have heard of this. Has anybody ever heard of the Gilgamesh epic? Gilgamesh, does that sound familiar? It's an, it's an ancient Babylonian legend, and it refers to a resting place of heroes and hints at a tree of life. In the pyramids of Egypt, the embalmed bodies and maps placed beside them as guides to a future world. The Romans believed that the righteous would picnic in the Elysian fields while their horses grazed nearby. Seneca, who was a Roman philosopher, said, the day thou fearest as the last is the birthday of eternity. And although these depictions of the afterlife differed, the unifying testimony of the human heart is that throughout history, there's a belief in life after death. Anthropological Evidence suggests that every culture has uh, this God-given, innate sense of the eternal. That the world is not all that there is. And here's the incredibly good news for all of us. God has a few things to say about time and eternity. And because we know from God's Word that He is the author of time, we would do well to listen to what He has to say about how we use that gift of time. As I was preparing this sermon, I couldn't stop thinking of this book called The Practice of the Presence of God. And the Carmelite brother Lawrence of the Resurrection, who over 300 years ago, as a simple and humble cook, learned and shared this very important lesson of it regarding the presence of God and through all of our daily and ordinary chores that was just something to be participated in. Brother Lawrence is quoted as sharing the following. He said this, At all times, every hour, and every minute, I drove everything out of my spirit that I might take that, that might take me from the thought of God. In other words, Brother Lawrence recognized and he lived out on a daily basis this idea that all time, every hour, every minute, every second truly belongs to God. And here's, here's the main idea that I want you to walk away with this morning. See, God has designed humanity for eternity. And that being the case, it is only logical that he wants to prepare us in this life for the life to come with him in eternity. And giving back to God means giving him your time now. This is ultimately, it's ultimately how we're prepared for life after life. Let's pray together. God, you are indeed the one who set this thing we call time into motion. God, you've never known a beginning. Lord, you will know no end. And God, as your creation, may we be so keenly aware of every moment of our lives that we would learn that this thing we call time, Lord, it's really yours. We are just stewards. We're managers of this time that we walk 
this planet. And may we do so uh, knowing that it's a gift from you to us to prepare us to be with you for time and eternity. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. I have a question. How many of you, okay, and you don't have to raise your hand if you, maybe, maybe you're good with this and you're okay. How many of you have a very clear sense of what you were made for? You have a very clear sense. I, I know what I was made for. Okay? All right. Okay. All right. You know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you're, you're sure you were made for this one singular thing, right? You, you know that. But here's the thing. What if I told you, no matter what you're good at, no matter how accomplished you are at it, no matter how much fulfillment you get from that certain thing, what you're actually made for is eternity. That, that's what you're actually, that's what we're actually made for. We're, we're made for eternity. Here's what King Solomon wrote, right? He said, God has set eternity in the human heart. You know, when you read that verse, all of a sudden, all those stories about all those ancient civilizations begins to make sense. We've been designed for eternity. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. In other words, we do have some limits, whereas God is limitless. He's limitless. And Solomon puts into words something that in all likelihood, everyone is probably thinking. And it's this. People have a longing desire to know the extra temporal. We want to know the things that, that happen outside of time as we understand it. The significance of themselves. The deeds that we do. What's, what's going to become of all of this? And that's why I say, if we put it another way, it's we're, we're made for eternity. If we're made for eternity, then in my head, I start, I start asking other questions, right? And one of the first questions that says, okay, if we're made for eternity, then who does our time belong to right now? I mean, I get the eternity part. I, I totally do. But what about right now? Well, again, here's a truth to live into, to lean into. When you see your life not as your own, when you recognize that, who you are, what you have, it's not yours. When you begin to see all your moments, all your experiences, all your abilities, all your success, and all your failures, and all your time as something that doesn't ultimately belong to you, but rather it belongs to God. Now speaking of having a very clear sense of their time belonging to God, all you have to do is look at Jesus right? Look at Jesus' life. I mean, think about it. For 30 years, nothing. Nothing. I don't know about you, but I got a couple of kids who are like approaching 30 years. They, they have something to say about everything, right? Jesus, for that first 30 years, as far as we know, think about this. Think about this. When we observe Jesus' life and his activities in the gospel, do we ever even one time get the idea that Jesus was confused about his time? Do we? Ever? Jesus was many things, but there's no image of him being panicked or regretful of how he spent time. He constantly spoke of doing whose will? Father's. He, he did that, yet we never read about Jesus being a workaholic, right? Or being so caught up in deadlines that he forgets to love the people around him. I, 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 I read this in a book by um, a guy named Kirk Nowry. It's, the book's called The Stewardship of Life. It's a really good little book. And this is what Kirk writes. He says, before his public ministry began, Jesus spent 30 years, 30 years, as a carpenter in the obscure village of Nazareth. 
We really have no idea how he spent his days there. But the implication of Scripture is that he was simply working like anyone else. His identity as Messiah is virtually unknown. So was he wasting his time during those silent years? Of course not. He, in the cosmic calendar, known only to God, those 30 years of quiet preparation prepared Jesus for three years of intensive, unprecedented service that we read about in the four Gospels. For us, friends, critical, critical are the words of the psalmist from Psalm 90, verse 12, where we're told, teach us to number our, God, our days, that we may gain our heart of wisdom. And, and I don't know about you, but I am more often than not particularly not the greatest manager of my time. I, maybe all of y'all are really good. Like you're super duper, you know, like you got it down. Like you think like a Franklin Covey daily planner. You know, maybe you do. Maybe you do. As a matter of fact, though, what I do find a good deal of the time is I kind of find myself frustrated because there's not enough time, Right? It's like, oh, if I just had five more minutes, if I just had two more minutes, if I just had two more weeks, right? Gordon McDonald wrote a book many, many years ago called Ordering Your Private World. I remember when that book came out, I was an undergrad, and it was like, oh, man, read that book. That's just going to help you get your life together. All it really did was make me feel guilty, but uh, he picked up on this idea with uh, symptoms uh, that... He, he kind of thinks, he kind of wrote about uh, help us in terms of how we, we grip or grasp the best use of our time. And, and maybe some of these things he mentions in the book, maybe some of these you can identify with. I know I can. My desk takes on a cluttered appearance, right? The condition of the inside of my car. Now, some of y'all know. The inside of your car needs some help, right? Right? He says uh, there are forgotten appointments, voicemails, missed deadlines, investing our energies in unproductive tasks. But then, then Gordon McDonald, he begins messing around. <laughs> he, he, he begins kind of messing with you when he says uh, things like, no time to enjoy intimacy with God. Uh, poor personal relationships a growing and gnawing sense of not liking who I am, my job, or much else about my own world. There was uh, an article that came out uh, regarding the suicide of a celebrity chef. His name is Anthony Bourdain. I don't know if you've ever heard that, that name, Anthony Bourdain. Mike Cosper wrote this. He said, some are scratching their heads. Wondering how someone so successful could do this. One, one family member told the New York Times he had everything. Success beyond his wildest dreams, money beyond his wildest dreams. But Bourdain himself told us that wasn't enough. And interestingly, on an episode of a program he hosted called Parts Unknown, he was in Argentina and he said this. He said, uh, well... Things have been happening. He said, I'll find myself in an airport, for instance, and I'll order an airport hamburger. It's an insignificant thing. It's a small thing. It's a hamburger, but it's not a good one. <laughs> Suddenly, I look at the hamburger, and I find myself in a spiral of depression that can last for days. It's like that with the good stuff, too. Mike Casper notes, our soul needs so much more. And food, money, grand experiences. Here's a, another question just talking about the importance of, asking about the importance of how we use our time in our lives. Be honest. Be honest. How many of us here would say that our lives are not busy? 
right? I mean, we would all say, it's a pretty common malady, right? We're just super busy. And as I was reading about time this week, I came across the thought that as a society, we typically rush from one thing to another, and usually in between the one thing to another, guess what we got going on in between? Something else, right? And a common response to the question, how are you today is, oh man, I'm really busy. Business, busyness is often equated with worth. Busyness is often equated with value and importance. And if you multitask, that's like passing go and getting $200, right? Folks, it's interesting that it's the beginning of the year. And if there were ever a time to make a deep, significant change in the way you want to live your life for God, this is it, okay? It's not too late. Just because it's January 14th, not January 1st, it, it makes no difference. God, God wants it all. He wants all your time. I think this is someone that people in Michigan know, right? I think people know Kirk Cousins. Does that name sound familiar? I don't know what they say at Michigan State, but I'm pretty sure they don't say hail. I think that's the other school that says that. But uh, Kirk Cousins former Michigan State Spartan and currently quarterback for uh, the Minnesota Vikings. He has a sculpture. Has, have you guys ever seen this story? He has a sculpture outside of his house, and it's got an odd purpose. It's intended to remind him that he's going to die. Well, sort of. <laughs> Planning to live to 90... The quarterback has a, a jar of 720 stones, one for each month he intends to live. And each month, he takes a stone out of the jar, and he carries it with him. He told um, a guy on ESPN that every month, he's going to take, take out a stone, put it in his pocket, and think, once this month is over, this is gone. You can't get it back. It's gone for good. Now, that is a little morbid. Until you remember that as Kirk takes out the stones, he has this visual reminder right outside of his front door that his time on earth is what? Getting shorter shorter right and again that may sound morbid at first but it's also biblical the idea actually came to cousins from a bible teacher i when i came across this i was blown away <laughs> in response to psalm 90 12 <laughs> teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom the this verse kirk says is about the importance leaving a mark, making a deposit in people's lives in a way that matters. In other words, you have to understand that life is coming to an end someday and that we only have so many days. Kirk Cousins says there's wisdom in that, right? So yes, it, it does come down to being better stewards of our entire lives, better stewards of all that we are, particularly as it relates to our time. As we realize that God wants all of us, He wants all of our time. Now, before we're done this morning, let me be very clear about something. Uh, that past times I know in my own life and in my own ministry, I've neglected to be clear about when it comes to God wanting our time. As a matter of fact, the person I mentioned a few months ago, I, I, we talked about this, being a master of his time while on earth, walking among us, the one whose birth we celebrated a few weeks ago, not, not my birthday, a few weeks ago, recognized that his time here on earth belonged to the Father and 
had no problem saying no. Did you know that? He had no problem saying no. Jesus said no to the temptations of Satan. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus had no problem saying no in Mark chapter 1 when he was literally begged to stay in Capernaum. Jesus had no problem saying no to the man he delivered from demons following him in Mark chapter 5. Jesus prayed all night and chose 12 disciples. That was it. That's all he chose. Jesus did not go to other parts of Africa, Europe, someplace else in the world either. And yet, at the end of his life, Jesus prayed with clarity. I've glorified you on earth and fulfilled the mission you set before me. God wants your time and has every right to all of it. However, however, there will be times when we must set limits and boundaries so that our doing for God does not become the thing that prevents us from being with God. Does that make sense? Sometimes we can get so wrapped up in doing, doing, and doing, and doing that we forget to say no to those things that are not what God has in mind for us. Thank you. Absolutely. That's right. That's exactly right. Thank you. So, did everybody hear what Ralph said? Do what do you must do what God has called you to do. Right. Well, right? If it makes you really busy, what you have to remember is that sometimes we, get, we can get really confused and jacked up around that, right? And we get ourselves all wrapped up in that, and we think, we think that what we want to do is more important than what God's called us to do. And sometimes, I'll admit this too, sometimes, there are people in my life who come to me and they want me to do something, and it seems so great and so good, right? So wonderful. But maybe that's not what God's called me to, right? And it's not about pounding someone else and making them feel bad or what. It's about learning how. That, yes, God does have complete call over all of our lives. We cannot allow what God has for us to be the best to be interrupted by something else that maybe seems kind of good. Because what God wants for us, what God calls us to, will always be the best. Does that make sense? Thank you, sir. Thank you. In 1879, the modern world changed forever because there was this patent that was introduced. It was issued for the invention of the carbon filament. Has anybody ever heard that, that phrase, a carbon filament? Carbon filament that was made of cotton and linen, thread, wood splints, paper, coiled in various ways. This process, which after fine tuning, would launch a company the following year dedicated to the commercial production of the electric light bulb. The Edison Company, the Edison Electric Company, offered its customers a safer, cleaner, cheaper alternative to gas lights. And as electric power begins to replace gas in homes and factories, for the first time in human history, work was no longer limited to the time between what? Sunrise and sunset. So with this modern utterance of let there be light, Thomas Edison invited humanity into a world that would not sleep. Edison himself believed sleep. He called it a waste of time. Edison himself was believed to, and known to work over 100 hours a week. He held his job interviews at 4 a.m. So if you wanted to go work for the Edison company, your job interview with that company started at 4 o'clock in the morning. 
He would insist that his employees kind of adhere to the same sleepless schedule that he did. He adhered to and promoted this philosophy that rest was the enemy of productivity. And in 1914, he said there's really no good reason why men should go to bed at all. It appears that his vision for sleepless humanity has begun to come to pass. How we use our time. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention They actually declared that there was a sleep deprivation epidemic among Americans. Thomas Edison's Let There Be Light, (laughs) well, it may have ushered into this sleepless phase, but the divine creator who uttered Let There Be Light, he also says Let There Be Rest, right? Use your time wisely. Use your time in a manner that's consistent with whom I've called you to be. And I share that story because it's important to know with all of these different challenges about what to do with your time, God's a God of limits, too. That's that's, that's important to remember. When all is said and done, precisely why? Why does God want all your time? I think we're here on this time side of eternity for preparation for something. We're learning how to live for something else. This is not the end of everything. As a matter of fact, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Last Battle. And this is what he says in the book he writes. He says, the end of the term, the beginning of the holidays, the end of the dreams, the holiday beginning. As for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can truly say that they lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world, it only been the cover, the, the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever and in every chapter is better than the one before. And that's that's why God wants it all. That's why God wants your time. He's, He's actually preparing us for the time to come when time no longer exists. Would you pray with me? God, help us to be people who recognize what it means to obey you. Lord, not to be caught up in the distractions that so often, so frequently demand our time. Lord, they take us away from becoming who you're calling us to become. They're taking us away from engaging in those activities you've called us to engage in. And Lord, may we also learn, even in the midst of that call, of those expectations, Lord, to be people who know what it means to live with limits, who know what it means to be able to, just like Jesus said, know what to say no to, but also know that we have fulfilled what you've called us to do, who you've called us to be. May we, may we truly become those people. We love you. We are grateful for this gift of time. May we use it in a way that glorifies you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. <laughs>